and going to the English. All right, so the situation that you're faced with, with your Uncle Gaius, um, in uh, the Domus Recentia, um, is that he has asked for a performance of these Roman odes from you. Um, now, if one were gonna get meta on this and try to figure out why it would be that the Demiurge would program the TSTT to make you describe a performance of these odes, um, one might say that because poetry was always read aloud, never read silently in the ancient world, um, it would have been really important not just to the fictional Bellator and Octaviana and Uncle Gaius to think about what sort of presentation these odes um, would have undergone, um, but it would have been essential to their meaning for them. And so hopefully as you conceptualize how a performance of the odes might unfold in the space of a Roman domus, thoughts are going to occur now that you've been through what the Roman domus is, what the various parts of it meant to the Romans, um, that go along with your growing conception of what Romanness meant um, at this period, uh, the strange period right after the BCE, CE divide, where Augustus is in charge uh, and um, everybody is starting to try to evaluate what the amazingly severe stuff through which Rome has just gone means to them. Um, so as you guys go on, um, you're gonna have the chance through some of the links that I'm gonna put in the mission assistant um, uh, for the 3102, the Latin section, these will appear, the, these um, sources will appear on the readings as links um, to explore the, um, that historical context and especially the cultural context that's created by Augustus with help, especially from Mycenaeus, trying to completely remake Roman culture. Um, transform it, I mean, not come up with an entirely new culture, but to take the cultural materials that were there that were set up for this thing called the Republic that just like went to utter shit in the, the first century BCE, to take those rules and reformulate them into this new thing that will eventually be called the empire, the imperium. Um, and it starts, and this is a little bit surprising, but it's gonna get hammered as we go through uh, the, the mission in ancient Rome. Um, he's not calling himself the emperor. Does anybody know what he called himself? He called himself, for English, the first citizen. It was called the principate. The princeps, yeah. So his, his rule is called the, the principate. And then when his heir, Tiberius, finally takes charge, that becomes called the domine, um, because he called it the lord, dominus. But um, princeps, um, um, first citizen is one way to put it. Um, boss is another way to put it. Um, but he has this incredible history of turning down titles that the Senate wanted to offer him. Um, so uh, eventually he accepts, and uh, it's kind of famously, he's famously reluctant to accept it. He eventually accepts the title Augustus um, and the title father of his country, which is why the patria, the fatherland, is kind of important. It's not just um, the patria, the, uh, the country that the kid is dying for in 3.2, uh, Odes 3.2. It's also Augustus himself, because he is the pater patriae. And one thing, one of the reasons that we took such a close look at the domus is that he more or less tries to turn Rome itself, the city of Rome, into his domus. Um, that is, he is the pater familias with this thing called patria potestas, which is um, the uh, legal doctrine in ancient Rome that the oldest male in any family had the power of life and death over the rest of the family. Um, so all of this is in the background of these odes, and uh, that's the kind of thing that I think the Demiurge is hoping um, you're going to be able to bring out at least somewhat in your performances. Um, and just to uh, show the mechanics, show the wires one more time, what I'm really looking for is for in your discussion of how your character should perform, 
that you're going to show me your engagement with the stuff. Um, it doesn't, whether or not Bellator and Octaviana put on a great performance doesn't matter so much. I mean, people in the past in this course have, um, have done some really funny things by having the performances of the characters be really bad. Um, so they can be really bad, they can be really good, or they can be just mediocre. But what really matters is your discussion and collaboration um, on what you think the character should do. Okay, so now let's go back into the poetry. Let the boy toughened by military service learn how to make bitterest hardship his friend, and as a horseman with fearful lance go to vex the insolent Parthians spending his life in the open in the heart of dangerous action and seeing him from the enemy's walls let the warring tyrant's wife and her grown-up daughter sigh ah don't let the inexperienced lover provoke the lion that's dangerous to touch whom a desire for blood sends raging so swiftly through the core of destruction it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country Yet death chases after the soldier who runs, and it won't spare the cowardly back or the limbs of peace-loving young men. Okay, so we're transitioning into stuff we haven't looked at before. And how does it, how does it fit together when Horace goes from it's sweet and fitting to die for one's country to yet death chases after the soldier who runs, and it won't spare the cowardly back or the limbs of peace-loving young men? Well, I would think, I mean, Horace is trying to urge young men to go towards military service and try to, you know, kind of idealize that. But he's also saying that, you know, being a coward or running away from it, it it's almost like desertion, I'm saying. I feel like he's talking about, you know, if you if you get into that and you run away, you're going to be deserting and that's cause for death, almost. Yeah, so one thing we're saying is that uh, military poetry um, and it, it's, military poetry certainly isn't dead at this point in our uh, cultural life, but um, in the classical tradition, it's a huge, huge thing. And one of the themes is what happens to people who run away. And it's worth noting that one of Horace's great Greek predecessors, a guy named Archilochus, um, famously said, um, uh, my enemy got my shield, but I don't care. I'm going to get another one just as good. Um, which implies that he ran away uh, and left his shield behind. Um, and uh, there's a, a famous um, sentiment from the Spartans that you may have heard. I don't know whether it featured in 300 or not. It's, um, it, you either come home with your shield or you come home on it. Exactly, right. So leaving your shield on the field of battle is uh, supposed to be the most cowardly thing you can do. Um, and here is, so Archilochus, who is kind of the founder of lyric poetry, which is the thing that Horace is doing in his own way in Latin a couple hundred years later, let's see. So Archilochus, who probably wasn't actually a real dude, but rather a tradition. So he's about 600. So we're talking about 550 years later that Horace is writing this, after the uh, odes, sorry, the lyrics of Archilochus are first known. Here is Horace saying, Romans don't do that, right? Romans are like Spartans, and I, as the poet of the Romans, and this gets a little bit to the thing in the first ode of talking about uh, poetry that nobody's heard before. I'm going to go in the other direction from Archilochus. I am going to recommend that um, you die, that you sweet and fitting to die for one's country, so don't run away. And then the other reason not to run away, this appears to be the, um, the, the thought. Marianne, you're gonna... I, was, I was literally thinking the same thing. Okay. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you run away, you're still going to die. Um, another reference here for people who have uh, read Homer or are interested in Homer, um, there's a very uh, famous speech uh, in the Iliad by a warrior named Sarpedon, where he says, here we are in the battlefield, and the spirits of death are all around us, so let us go and fight and either win the kleos, win the glory, or give it to somebody else. Um, and this is the foundation of one version of the warrior epic, which, which is, it's a zero-sum game. I kill you, I get the glory, you lose the glory, you kill me, you get the glory, I lose the glory. Um, and Horace is uh, framing that in his own way, and in, in his own very Roman way. Um, okay, so no use running away, it won't spare the coward um, or anybody who loves peace. Um, so in this kind of Roman world where we're conquering 
the Mediterranean, um, this is the way we have to think. Okay, now the kicker. We have two stanzas, both which begin, and this is true in Latin and in Klein's translation, with the word virtue, or in Latin, virtus. 